Hi, welcome back to Reviving the Horse Channel this week. Uh, glad you've taken the time to listen to another video. Have you ever heard the statement, God helps those who help themselves? You know, when this script was being put together for these video, for this particular video, when the notes were coming together, I actually, the notes were already together. Um, and I remember one day I had the TV on and there was a series on television being previewed. Um, and an upcoming episode, they sh showed an excerpt of the episode. And right in that very episode, one of the characters said, well, you know, God helps those who help themselves. And I kind of laughed when I heard that because this script for this video had literally just been produced probably within two to three weeks of that. And I think when I heard it, I was like, oh my goodness. Yeah, we hear that a lot today, don't we? God helps those who help themselves. Is that true? Does God help those who help themselves? We're going to look at that on today's video. I want to start with a scripture out of Revelation 3.17. This is where the church of Laodicea uh, was being spoken to. And it says, for you say, I have wealth and have got together goods and land and have need of nothing. And you're not conscious of your sad and unhappy condition that you are poor and blind and without clothing. So he's speaking to a people here who basically felt pretty self-sufficient. It says they had wealth. They had goods and land. They had need of nothing. So they thought they were in pretty good shape. And this is referring to a church. This is referring to a people of God, a spiritual people. But he points out to them, you're not conscious of your sad and unhappy condition. That you are poor and blind and without clothing. You know, one thing we can count on with trials and hard times in our lives is they really can show us our need for God. Our need for God. I mean, we should never take God for granted, but it is true that whenever God's people, even in the Old Testament, and I'm sure it still happens today, when things were going good, there was no sickness in the body, no sickness in the mind. The finances were all good. The work was all good. Relationships were all good. Uh, good movies to watch, good food to eat. You know, everything's good. It's so often in those good times that we slack off. And we just tend to think, man, we are so blessed and doing so well and so, you know, all this. But what really shows what we are is not what comes out in the good times, it's what comes out in the bad times. It's what shows up in that really hard place. That place where you think you just might go under because it's just that heavy. That's when it really shows up. And so often we think we're doing pretty good when in fact, like the church here, he said, you have no idea that you're in a sad condition and you're blind and you're naked. As long as we are in a position of denying our own condition and we blame it on something else, like when I was really depressed, um, sometimes I think, I mean, I've never had a group of, depre uh, of prior depressed people together to really do a study or really find out, but I'd be curious to see people who really dealt with a lot of depression, either frequently or maybe had a really bad bout of it, you know, what's on their mind a lot, you know, a lot of times there's a lot of blame. There's a lot of uh, upset with other people. Um, pity parties are really common when you're depressed. They really are. You, you really have yourself on your mind a lot. Um, and you're just thinking about, man, I just don't know why I'm here. Nobody cares about me. Nobody cares about me. You know, nobody takes notice. Nobody listens to me. I don't know. I don't know why I'm here. I mean, I try, I try, I try, and it just never, never, never works out. Does that sound familiar? It really is often rooted in we just kind of blame other people rather than looking at our own condition. And as long as we stay in that position, we stay really unconscious of God. Um, you know, God is spirit, and we know him in our spirit. But 
there's always an awareness and a consciousness in our mind that always really needs to be in place there. And so often depression and other hard things can just begin to dull our senses to the spirit of God. And we just become really unconscious of him. And really, for me, that's a place that I came to um, in my life. I just realized I had become very unconscious of God and way more conscious of myself, first and foremost, and then conscious of just the world around me and the darkness around me, really. More conscious of that than anything else. Look with me at Psalm 32, 1. It is a great blessing when people are forgiven for the wrongs they've done, when their sins are erased. It's a great blessing when the Lord says they're not guilty, when they don't try to hide their sins. Verse 3, Lord, I prayed to you again and again, but I didn't talk about my sins. So I only became weaker and more miserable. Every day, life got harder for me. I became like a dry land in the hot summertime. Wait, doesn't this sound interesting? I don't know if you've ever been depressed or you know somebody that's ever dealt with depression off and on, but listen to this. This, this was me, you know, and I didn't see the scripture obviously till well after the fact, but when I read it, it was like, wow, I so relate to this. Psalm 32, three, Lord, I prayed to you again and again, but I didn't talk about my sins. You know, I did do that. When I remember when I was depressed and feeling kind of down and being a Christian, I mean, of course we still pray off and on, right? I mean, seriously, because the spirit of God is in you. And even when your mind is surrounded by the dark and your circumstances are engulfed in the dark, the spirit of God still at times tries to draw you out of the pit. He tries to talk to you and tries to you know, inspire some consciousness again. And he did it with me off and on. And so, yeah, I would pray once in a while, however I prayed, but I didn't talk about my sins. I didn't talk about where my condition was. It was more boo-hoo, Lord, please help me. I mean, it just seems like nobody cares. Nobody listens to me. You know, why am I here? You know, kind of like when Job and Jeremiah were talking about, why am I born? Why didn't you let me die when I was, you know, I'm just boo, just down. This is where it's at. You just become weaker and more miserable. Life just gets harder when you don't deal with the sin issue. Listen to this. I read this scripture in the English Revised Version, and I just had to share it. Listen to this. Psalm 109, verse 22. I am only a poor, helpless man. I'm so sad my heart is broken. I feel my life is over, fading like a shadow at day's end. I feel like a bug that someone pushed away. I feel like a bug that someone brushed away is what it says. Brushed away. Oh boy, is this a pathetic sounding way of thinking? I have been here. I mean, the devil had me in such a place. My mind had me in such a place that I felt like a bug. That somebody was just brushing away. This is a pretty sad existence. But it's because I wasn't seeing my own heart condition. And I had become totally unconscious. Totally unconscious and dull to the spirit of God. This is a pretty pathetic state you come into if you allow yourself to go here. So back to our original question at the beginning of the video, does God help those who help themselves? The answer is no. I don't know where that saying came from, but it's not Bible. God does not help those who help themselves. He helps those who cannot help themselves, who have sunk to such a low state, who have really drug their chin so far down on the carpet for so long they can't look up. This is who God helps. Look at Psalm 72, verses 12 through 14. The Lord delivers the needy when he calls out, the poor also and him who has no helper. He will have pity on the poor and weak and needy and will save the lives of the needy. He will redeem their lives from oppression and fraud and violence. 
You know, the Lord showed me, I remember when I was really depressed and at one point when I came back and the Lord was restoring me, I at times wondered why didn't people take notice? Why didn't my husband notice? Why didn't people notice that I was so distressed? And and I really didn't get, and as I can't really say, thus saith the Lord, but one thing that occurred to me was if somebody else had really taken notice and really come to my rescue, it would not have prevented me from going back there again. I really needed to be in a position where I had no helper, like this verse just said that I just read. The Lord helps those who have no helper. Who have no helper. You know, I have led a fairly lonely life uh, at, at, at times in my Christianity especially. I was actually pretty lonely as a non-believer as well, but but I've had a lot of loneliness as a Christian, and, it, and at times it really bothered me because I belong to the body of Christ. I've always belonged to a church. Many times I've served in many different areas in the church, and yes, I knew people and they knew me, but I was still very lonely. I, it was very difficult to just have close friends because most people already have all the friends they can handle, and we've only got so many hours in a day, right, to have relationships with people. So typically it just didn't happen for me, but I know for me, the Lord just let me know, he's my friend. And even if I have nobody else, I have him. And, you know, sometimes that's the way he wants it. Because sometimes when we have other people around us that are always rescuing us, always there for us to pick us up every time we fall down, we tend not to cry out to God too much. We tend not to cry out to God too much. But when you have no one to help you, no one's taking notice, no one's picking you up, no one's even around God is there. The Holy Spirit is there. I've discovered that real faith is activated through helplessness. Real faith comes into play when we're helpless in ourselves. It's when I'm empty and I'm hungry that I'm going to go seek out what I need. If I feel really secure about the fact that I'm full, like the, like the church in Laosidea, I have everything I need. I don't need anything. Then I'm not going to seek. It's when we're hungry and thirsty that we seek out something to quench the thirst and fill the hunger. So helplessness is not a bad place to be. To be in a position, now don't get me wrong, I'm not condoning, hey, let's all get depressed and down to realize how helpless we are. I think we all come to the realization as Christians in different ways. We're not all going to walk the exact same journey. But we do all need to come to the realization that God helps those who know they need help. God feels the need of those who know they have need. The greatest danger we can have as Christians, the greatest danger that God's people always faced, even in the Old Testament, was coming to a place of thinking that everything was all good. Everything is good. Everything's happy. Everything's wonderful. Because that's when we can tend to get lukewarm. We can tend to get comfortable. God lives in the humble. Those who know that they're nothing without him. He lives in the humble. And he revives the, he revives the downhearted. People that are up all the time don't need reviving, do they? It's those of us that get down. We feel helpless, but we don't want the enemy just to beat us and say, you're no good. God's disappointed. He's fed up with you. Give it up. Give it up. He's put up with you long enough. That's a lie. He revives the downhearted. Look with me at Isaiah 57, 15. For this is the word of him who is high and lifted up, whose resting place is eternal, whose name is holy. My resting place is in the high and holy place. And this is God speaking. And with him who is crushed and poor in spirit to give life to the spirit of the poor and to make strong the heart of the crushed. Listen, God loves everyone. He loves everyone. But the one, he the one he really lives with and responds to 
is the one who knows their need. The one who really has discovered, I can't do life without God. I can't do life without God at any level. Psalm 145, 14 says, The Lord upholds all those of his who are falling and raises up all those who are bowed down. I testify to the fact that he raised me up from being bowed down and he kept me from falling to my death. And I discovered what I needed to discover that it's when I'm helpless that he is there. That's when true faith is really activated. I don't need faith when I've got everything under control, everything's all good. I need faith when I realize that, Lord, I can't do this without you. I remember after, well, I, I don't want to jump ahead here. Let me hang on a moment. I think I'm jumping the gun here. Hang on. Satan's agenda has always been to remove man from his source of life in order to destroy him. You know, we have this like wonderful umbilical cord to heaven. And as long as that umbilical cord is intact, we're doing good. But he wants to try to sever that umbilical cord, sever that dependence on the Holy Spirit so that he can step in and try to bring destruction in our lives. Because God is our source of life. 1 Corinthians 8, 6 says, For there is only one God, and he is our Father. All things come from him, and we live for him. And there's only one Lord Jesus Christ. All things were made through him, and we also have life through him. We're told in John 15, 6, if a person does not live in Christ, he is thrown out like a broken off branch and withers. If we do not live attached to the vine, is where Jesus is teaching here in John 15, then like a branch that's broken off, we wither and die. You know, we can literally become like a fish out of water if we don't stay connected to the Holy Spirit every day. And what's ha what happens to a fish when you take it out of water? You take it out of its natural element. You take it out of its, its place of life. And, and that fish will struggle and fight and ah, until it eventually dies if it's not placed back in its source of life. And we can become like a fish out of water if we disconnect from God in any way, shape, or form. When we start to disconnect, you can always tell when you're disconnecting from God because the struggle is on. Just like when you take a fish out of water, it begins to fight and flip around. That's what we do. There's a struggle that starts to take place. Struggle. There's, there's just lack of peace, lack of rest. Struggle. And if we, we remain there, we eventually can die there. And that's what Satan's all about. That's what he's hoping to encourage us to do with our different temptations and choices. John 15, 4 says, Remain united to me, and I will remain united to you. Again, this is Jesus talking about the vine and the branches. He says in verse 5, I am the vine, and you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will bear much fruit, for you can do nothing without me. Those who do not remain in me are thrown out like a branch and dry up. We do not have life outside of the Spirit of God. We do not have life outside the Spirit of God. We can only stay alive in our hearts. We can only stay alive as we stay joined to God. But like a fish out of water, if we're one of those Christians that after a while, our Christianity is more an intellectual belief system. It's more an external set of duties that we do every week. We go to church, we usher, we serve in this area, serve in that area. But the rest of the time, we pretty much talk and act like everybody else. It's become an intellectual religion, and that will never hold you, and it will never be a source of life to you. And like this branch that, dis that gets dis disconnected from the, from the vine, you eventually wither and get weak 
until the enemy can hopefully take you out. Now, unlike the old covenant, this new covenant that Jesus brought us gives us a new spirit. In the Old Testament, they just had to have observances, external observances, and, and had to try to just abide by the different regulations and decrees that God gave to that would satisfy him. The different sacrifices that had to be done and the different rituals they had to go through. And he had to do that because he was dealing with flesh. He wasn't dealing with born-again spirits. He was dealing with flesh. So it was all these external rules and regulations. Well, this new covenant we're in gives us a new spirit. It's a whole different covenant. Ezekiel 36, 26 says, I'm going to give you a new heart and I'm going to give you a new spirit within all of your deepest parts. I'll remove that rock hard heart of yours and replace it with one that's sensitive to me. This is the international standard version I'm reading. Verse 27, I'll place my spirit within you empowering you to live according to my regulations and to keep my just decrees. Listen, this Christianity that we live in today is not just another religion. I've said it over and over and over and over and over, as well as many others in the body of Christ, as well as the scriptures. It is not a dead external religion like so many of the hundreds of thousands that are out there. The devil likes to make all these false external religions to try to throw us off and make us think we're just part of that batch. We're not. Christianity stands alone. It is an internal life. It is a brand new born again spirit that no other religion offers anywhere in the world. But as a Christian, if we don't stay connected to that living spirit inside, if we don't stay obedient to the Holy Spirit's leading and let him direct and let him control and let him lead, we can still get sidetracked and get off into a dangerous area. And I know for me, when I came back to this place of realizing how far away I had disconnected from the Lord, when I came back, he began to talk to me about how I needed to relearn some things. Because if you've been a Christian for any length of time, you've learned a few things. Sometimes we think we know too much. Well, I've learned a lot. I've been a Christian for 29 years. Well, we do learn a lot in our Christian walk. But a lot of what we learn is false. A lot of what we learn begins to make us think that what we know in our minds is really what it is. But I have learned since my heart got revived again, since God brought me back, if you will, from the dead, so to speak, since I was so close to taking my own life, since he brought me back from that place, I have since learned that much of what I thought I knew is what I was relying on to keep me. And yet the only one that can keep us is the Holy Spirit of God. And we have to be connected to him and have a living, breathing experience with him every day in order for that to happen. But we get thinking it's all what we know here. It's all our past experience that's going to keep us. And it just doesn't. It will fail you. We must have this living relationship with God. So how does he revive us? If you've gotten to a place where you've grown cold or like me, you've just hit the bottom somehow. And you know you haven't been relying on the Holy Spirit, which is why you got where you got. Because let's face it, those who are led by, by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Those that are led by Him are not going to be led into a deep pit of depression or into sin. He's not going to lead us into the dark. And if we say, you know, First John says, if you say that you live in the light, But everything you do is in the dark. Everything you practice, all your habits are habitually in the dark, and yet you say you have the light in you. First John actually tells us that the truth's not in us. So we need to always make sure that we're even still born again. And when I say still born again, I don't, I, what I'm referring to is some people think they've been born again when really they just took on religion. They took on knowledge in their minds. You know, you can take the Word of God and you can read this book and it's just words on a page like any other book. 
and it will store up in here as head knowledge. But in, unless you have the Holy Spirit of God in you to make this real, to actually bring this to pass in your experience, you have nothing more than religion. And religion will not save you. Religion is not eternal life. Jesus Christ is eternal life. And that is found in relationship with him. So how does God revive us? Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. This is Jesus speaking. This is how he revives us. And this is how he keeps us. Come to me, all of you who labor and are burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke on you and learn from me. For I'm gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to carry and my burden is light. You know, I would read about the rest of God. For years I read about the rest of God. But I never really lived there. I had never come into the experience of it because I had a lot of head religion. Not heart relationship. Not spirit relationship. And since my heart's been revived, I have come into this heart relationship. And that's where... I've been in the last over five years, and that's where the teaching that's going to be coming up in the next year on this channel is going to be going. I'm going to be sharing with you all that God has shown me and what he's brought me into and is still bringing me into. I have not attained the destination yet, but I'm on a road that I wasn't on before. And I know on this road, I will never taste depression again. I will never, ever get to that place of deception again as long as I'm on this road. Proverbs 3, 5 says, With all your heart you must trust the Lord and not your own judgment. Always let him lead you and he will clear the road for you to follow. So how, did he, how does he revive our hearts? How does he make us conscious again of his Holy Spirit? When we get to the place where we realize we can't help ourselves. When true faith is activated because I realize I can't do this. I finally confessed to the Lord, Lord, I don't know how to be married. I don't know how to be a mother. I don't know how to have relate, right relationships. Whenever I think I'm doing something right, it, 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 it goes wrong. I just had to realize I couldn't do it. And guess what? He's just waiting for us to realize that because that's when he can go, yes, finally. Now I can come in and teach you and show you. And a lot of the learning that takes place at this point is a lot of unlearning of old stuff. You know, a lot of times we got to deprogram before we reprogram. We got to clean out the clutter before we bring in the new. And that's where I was in this place. So the Lord's ready to revive the hearts of anyone who realizes they can't do it for themselves. Anyone who realizes they can't help themselves. They need him for everything. If there's an area of your life where you feel like you can, you're, you're fine, you're good, you don't need God. Well, then he won't step in there. He steps in when you know you need him. He steps in when you know you can't do it without him. He steps in when you're truly humble before him and know that you are helpless without him. You are helpless. So join with me today, lifting our hands in full surrender to the Lord. That Lord, we want to be revived again. We've grown cold or maybe even just lukewarm. Either way, it's not good. Maybe we're in sin. Maybe we're not in sin, but we're just struggling. We lift our hands to you today, Lord, and ask you to revive our hearts and start us on a brand new journey that will continue into eternity and keep us out of any more dark pits. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for watching this video today and stay with me for next week. Have a great week. Keep looking up, keep talking to the Lord. Bye.